The His Girl Friday podcast is brought to you in part by Messenger Fellowship, living the kingdom, fulfilling the call, proclaiming the truth. How's it going, guys? This is Cameron Fry coming at you, 8 o'clock p.m. Central Time on a Monday night. At home this time, I'm not in a car, I'm not in my office. I am recording this in the comfort of my home. I hope you guys are staying safe, staying healthy. It's been a great month. It's been a weird month, but it's been overall a pretty solid month. It's hard to believe that we're on the doorstep of meteorological falls, one of my favorite times of year when summer is on its way out, autumn, my favorite season, on the way in, and kind of like how it is with work lately, I find myself getting acclimated, kind of adjusted and assimilated to the season that I'm in, even though it's had its ups and downs. I know for many, troubleshooting turbulence has been a theme. Um, Some of us still feel like a fish out of water, caught up in this Pandora's box of a year. I'm not in the mood to keep blasting 2020, by the way. I know it's been a weird year. It's been a tough year. It's been a difficult year, not on all accounts, but most accounts. It's been an uncomfortable year. How about that? But I think overall, we could look back on this year with a grin from ear to ear, knowing what it produced. We need stretches in our lives where perseverance and courage are refined, reformed, brought to the forefront. And I find myself beginning to see how God is working within the tapestry of this year. I know nationally, maybe, you know, state and federal levels, it's chaotic, you know, there's a lot of negative stuff. But to me, I feel like, I'm I'm not trying to belittle some of the hardships that are going on, but I feel like the way media influences everything. I mean, I think just so much of the strife we see is just more public. It's more broadcast. It's more out there in your face. And the reality is much hasn't changed over the years. I think that should be what grips us. It's just the lack of change over time. It's not that things are getting worse. It's just that things were more in the dark, maybe more hidden because we didn't have Uh, you know, a way to put a microphone to everything, even 10, 15 years ago. So I think it's just a unique season that we're in across the board. I'm not here to talk about 2020. I am here to talk about labels, not packing labels. I'm not one of those people who are going to, you know, who has a YouTube channel with eBay or Poshmark tutorials. (laughs) I am going to talk about a deeper kind of label, the internal kind, the, the labels that you can't see. The ones that are difficult to handle, tough to process. And as one who has endured his fair share of labels throughout his life, I'm coming at you raw. My heart is sensitive to those wrestling with identity tonight. To those struggling in the shadow of slander and prejudice. For many listening to this, we know the truth of who we are, at least on paper. But the fact is, many are in the dark to what makes them unique. Many don't have a darn clue about who they are. And that's one of the general conflicts of life is that collision, that friction between, all right, I know who I am in Christ if we're saved and we belong to the Lord. He is living, breathing, operating within us versus those who are lost or maybe they're just significantly backslidden. I don't know. But there is that friction, that dissonance that's ongoing. It's not going to go away. And if we're to mature and influence within our arenas of expertise, within communal arenas, how we stand firm when we're assailed by this demographic is worth discussion. I'm going to take a marketplace twist to this tonight, or rather I'm going to apply a marketplace lens, but know that this operates in and outside the office. For those of you who are just tuning in, maybe not familiar with His Girl Friday, we are a bivocational ministry or a vocational ministry, you know, the bi... I mean, we're all bivocational to a certain extent. I'm not here to get in the weeds on that, but many of you wear many hats. You're looking to make ends meet. You're employed a number of different ways. And regardless of what we do or where we're at, whenever vulnerability strikes, having a game plan with respect to this issue is vital in our quest to become more than conquerors. That's straight out of Romans 37, by the way. I'm going to cite my sources tonight, a lot of sources. <laughs> How we deal with people who put us in boxes, who label us unfairly, unjustly, that's a common thread no matter 
where we're at. I mean, we could just be in a public place. You know, we could be at the park <laughs> just chilling and someone, maybe it's a glance that takes the form of a fiery dart. Maybe, you know, we have this history. We have these analogs that maybe we're blind to or we've forgotten and we just, you know, something happens and we it rubs off the wrong way. We don't know how we feel, but we just feel all of a sudden super depressed because of what one moment, how it conjured up a whole bunch of negative memories. So we're going to keep this 15, 20 minutes tonight. But regardless of the timestamps involved, I really want to talk about three ways we can bust the boxes people put us in and prevent their labels from becoming our tags. So this is a three ways to piece. I am one of those people, but I do think it's good to offer bite-sized encouragement and counsel to people. Maybe they only have three, four minutes. They're on the subway. They're on the tram, and they're you know just glancing through, and this is their one shot to, to see, to visualize, to interpret, to internalize and analyze the truth of who they are and how it applies to this concept, to this reality of you know people are going to just hate they're just going to lavish their own insecurities on us and it's good to have a game plan it's good to be ready and prepared especially when things are going right and we're like okay you know don't look over your shoulder for something to be wrong but when crap hits the fan you know it's it's important to know again who you are the foundations of what you believe have a belief system that you're anchored to and that's my first point anchor your belief before we take any action the best way to deal with backbiting of any kind is to resist fear through the scriptures this is going to make sense if you're a believer if you're not well i think it's important to believe in something personally i'm not going to advocate other beliefs cuz i believe there's only one way the truth and the life and that's jesus christ Resisting fear, though, there's a lot of different ways we can do that. As a Christian, through the scriptures, that's not an option. That's a that's paramount. That's a requirement. God's word is the only word that matters at the end of the day. Mine doesn't. Don't take my word for it. Whatever I say here tonight, go to the scriptures. Back it up. That's why I love to cite my sources. I, I want to be a willing vessel, a mouthpiece of the Lord. I want his word speaking through me anytime I cut a pod. Well, how I respond... As follow-through is important when backbiting happens. How we react in moments, or in the heat of the moment, rather, is just as, if not more, crucial. Here's a check down of some verses I quote when I sense typecasting, favoritism, or neglect. <laughs> On the job. 1 Timothy 2.7, Amplified, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound judgment and personal discipline, Abilities that result in a calm, well-balanced mind and self-control. Don't you just love the full-fledged version of that passage? Love, power, and sound mind. But sound mind, man, that I love how the Amplified ties that to discipline, the fruit of faithfulness, and alludes to a spiritual gift mix that we all have. It's not that you know some people have and some don't. We all have a unique spiritual gift mix, and that's one of my... Holy burdens, if you will, to help people discover that in walking side by side with them. First John 14 through 19, these are common verses, but still worth repeating. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Psalm 34, 4, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. That verse has been rocking my life since the third grade, and that's it's going to continue rocking my life until the day I see him face to face. Those are some examples of scriptures that I quote when I'm taking thoughts captive. By thoughts, I mean insecure thoughts, fearful thoughts, anxious thoughts, worry thoughts in the moment. That's one of the signs of spiritual maturity. It's just, you know, it's not so much like, oh, I, I, I don't want to feel the shame or guilt of being afraid. No. Be real. Like It's okay to be afraid, but what you do with being afraid is all the more important. It, it, that's what really defines a, ma- a spiritually mature person. I have this fear. I'm not going to deny it because that would be deceiving myself. I have this fear in front of me. I'm tempted to be fearful, and I admit that. I'm not going to deny that. But Jesus, like that's the thing. Like, Am I referencing yielding to my Lord and Savior? Am I letting him be more than enough in the moment when... 
I'm tempted to do blank. In this case, when I'm tempted to believe what people are suggesting or implying through their demeanor, through their behavior, through, and, and shifts in attitude, sometimes it's, it's just flat out direct. Sometimes it's more just this built up love void. It's people who are just very consistent to look you over, pass you over, not give you any form of encouragement for years and years and years, and you're in close proximity and you wonder what the heck is going on. For me, it's not so much, you know, for a lot of us, it's not the direct presence of evil, but it's this intentional lack of good that sometimes could feel just the same, and we, we lose track of which is which. So these scriptures, they represent a short list. Obviously, you can customize your fear-resistant prayer guide however you please. Just be advised when you're on the clock in real time. Our tendency to misread and misjudge what we observe is constantly tested. And that's great, actually, when you think about it. I'm not trying to force a rose-colored lens on you, but it's great that we have that in front of us, that it's not like, okay, I'm going to be tempted to fear certain days, but, you know, for the most part, I'm good. We should want to be constantly refined day in and day out, leveling up in, in, in the spirit, if you will. And hence why it's even more important not only to know what you believe, but also how to take captive what doesn't align. I could respect someone, maybe their belief system is off, but they adhere to it. They at least are, you know, they want to be anchored to something absolute. I respect that. And when something doesn't align to that absolute, they have a game plan in place. You know, that's what we're talking about tonight. The bedrock, as we've alluded to, the word of God. And that's what we should all try to adhere to at the end of the day. We should try to live that in our words, in our actions, in our selfless love for one another as a way of drawing other people to that reality in case they aren't there yet. And there's a lot of people we work with who aren't there yet, but they're on their way. Let's be part of that conduit. Bottom line, when you suspect uh, attitudinal shifts, I don't even know if I'm saying that word right, but shifts in attitude, be slow to believe what you perceive. Oftentimes, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg with, with people day to day. You know, sometimes they, they look annoyed at us or other times they, you know, they skip our cubicle and they go to the next and they're engaging someone and they just they go a long period of time without engaging us. And we're like, what did I do? Don't do it that way. Don't be afraid to resist unnecessary judgments, labels and deceptions. Maybe you feel like, OK, you know, you're, you're trying to tie you're trying to make sense of things. You're like, okay, there has to be a reason why someone so is not talking to me or why they haven't acknowledged me in this way or haven't affirmed me. But so-and-so, it's like, you know, what did I do? Like, it's just so easy to go there to try to rationalize what we observe. And that's what I'm talking about. Be slow to that. Even if all you can do is defer in the moment, defer in faith with the hope of casting all anxieties on the Lord. That's where you want to go is First Peter 5, 7. That's the bottom line of this point. Be slow to judge, but that includes receiving judgments on yourself unnecessarily. Point number two, pray into the offense. I'm not saying we accept the offense, but this point ties in the idea that when we are going through turbulence, when we're, again, when crap is hitting the fan, when we're going through a tough time, let's not deny it, let's not try to resist it, but just like when we are driving on the road and we lose grip, we lose traction, the advice is the, the best way to handle a loss of control at the wheel is to, is to take the wheel and turn it into the direction of the direction you're already going. It's not to go against the grain. It's not to go against the turn to get back on track, which is the common response for most people. But you have to further turn into the wrong direction as that will more than likely get you back on track and complete this loop. It's counterintuitive, but that's why in driver's ed they talk about this point very often. And so offense is like losing traction, losing friction with the tires on the road. We want to go against the grain. We want to take the wheel into our own hands and we want to force the issue. We want to force you know, getting back on track in our own terms and what makes sense. But when we turn in, when we when we pray into the turn, we pray into the offense. That's when God's power begins to manifest and begins to brighten and, and clarify what we're experiencing around us. 
When we suspect people are labeling us, it's hard not to take offense. Even if we can't prove a typecast, the temptation to rationalize what we're sensing is real, sometimes tantalizing. I know for me, when I perceive a relational distancing from colleagues or coworkers, I start to crave reconciliation before it's necessary. On one level, I feel a surge of self-preservation, desperate to find a reason why. On another, I'm frustrated to have to own anything in the first place. So in a sense, it's like this windless tug of war. I want to be heard. I want to be understood and not given up on. But in case those fears verify, I want to at least be the next best thing to be right. Not exactly a sustainable formula if community is to be a pure pursuit, a pure priority. Now, I have no problem being transparent with you, not because this is a pod, but because I have no problem being vulnerable, knowing that I am not alone. Someone out there is listening to this and they're amending. They're, they, they, they can identify with this struggle. The fact is, in most cases, insecurity fuels our offenses. And if we don't acknowledge and repent of them, they can pollute our view of relationship, of identity, of place and purpose, etc. And the more people put up with this, they tolerate their own insecurities and tolerate their own offenses. We're just kind of like in this pinball machine where we're all just tilting off each other's offense and we're all tilting off each other's 10%, the tip of the iceberg, struggling to make sense of it. And we, we know there's more, but we just get frustrated when we're not allowed to that more, when we're denied access somehow to going deeper with people. We take it as rejection. I know that's part of my problem. It's I want to wall up. I don't want people to reject me. I want to reject myself. Even if I don't agree with it, at least I, you know, I could make a case where Okay, so-and-so is being this way towards me. I feel this projection. I don't know. It's probably nothing, but I'm still sensing something, so I'm going to turn this on myself. I'm going to take this into my own hands. I'm going to reject myself and wall up. I'm going to remove myself from the equation, and (laughs) I'm not going to put myself in position to potentially be rejected. So many people do this. That's why, you know... Our Father, <laughs> hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The foundation for Jesus Culture's um, Spirit Breakout song. And one of the lyrics in that song, Break Our Walls Down, ties in the Lord's Prayer to the idea that walls don't have a place in our life. Just like silos don't have a place in our life. So what then? If people are nice one day and suddenly stop acknowledging our existence the next, we're supposed to keep our mouth shut and be okay with it? Well, no, I'm not saying we neglect the opportunities to bridge divides, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Conversely, I'm saying if grudges or walls emerge, we must first lean on God's understanding. We must reference him and yield on him to accurately see the situation. We should care to see how he sees From there, we could take rest knowing we're being proactive and sowing peace as opposed to being reactive and making peace. Can't force the issue with peace. (laughs) They're like seeds we sow as an overflow. But we want to take matters in our own hands, even with something good like peace. Which, by the way, it's just, if, if we're making peace, we're probably making something else. Just being honest. We know First Timothy 2, 1 through 5, which is you know, the precursor to verse 7. We just read that. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Through him we could persevere in prayer and thanksgiving that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And I love that phrase, come to the knowledge of the truth, because it's more than just who God is, but knowing that that's the basis for how we can see ourselves and how we can see other people and thus by proxy how Life is being lived, just knowing that, okay, this is who you are. There's still going to be flies in the ointment. There's going to be flaws and sins and strongholds and generational strongholds and curses. You know, again, we don't fight people and their words and their actions, but, you know, we contest the this, this spiritual bondage, the principalities of darkness that bind them. 
ties in what I was saying earlier. It's like we're going to – there's no way around that. We're going to rub up against – we're going to bump up against those principalities. and it's gonna, They're going to be confusing because they're not our own. They're going to be confusing because we've taken some of this captive before. We've denied it. And it's good if it, we're far removed from it. That's like I can't relate to this principality. But I know my response though. I know the word says to pray for these people and to not cut them out, to not just deny them love. It makes sense for them to deny me, or and really they're denying the truth of who they are and who God is to them. <laughs> oh, we take that personally and gets us in hot water, gets us in more messes. And even if we think we're avoiding the mess by cutting ourselves out of the equation, I'm telling you, loneliness withdrawal is not the answer. I've done that, and I'm one who is coming out of this depression that he's put himself in. I, I'm i going through the counseling right now. I'm just, again, being real, being raw. It's like I put, I put myself in position to need help in a way where counseling through depression was necessary. And so a lot of this, I'm not speaking my truth. I'm, I'm wanting to speak his truth to you because I find that that's, you know, he's the only way out. He's the only way up. He's the only way worth... <laughs> modeling is the only way worth going so bottom line yield to god see correction before direction don't just start going don't just start moving in a certain direction really just pause and like god i want to aim and flow i want to go after your target so see correction before direction let god be the space between your hurts and emotions even if you don't know how that's supposed to look pray it in release the want to control manipulate and be a victim victimization is no place when it comes to even thinking about the labeling people are applying to us. All the while, pray into the offense and don't be overcome by the absence of good. Rather, be the good in the voice you sense, real or imagine. Final point, turn the cheek and the tide. For most of us, we're familiar with Matthew 5, 30 through 40. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is wrong. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. While the general meaning of this passage is to approach evil in the opposite spirit, the concept of turning the other cheek could still be confusing. I know it can be to me. Every now and then I'll do a double take. I'm like, I need to look this up or drill down on it again. I've done it before, but turning the other cheek, what does Jesus mean by this? Is he suggesting we tolerate the presence of malice, gossip, passive aggressiveness? Ugh, I hate that, and that's probably more frequent than the other two. Even silos in our workplaces? Is he hinting we embrace suffering and survivalism is socially acceptable? Not at all. Contrarily, he's implying we encourage all people through a double portion of his nature. When in doubt, double down. To who he is, reflect who he is, ready who he is. For instance, if we encounter a void of good when people are intentionally forsaking us, don't respond by doing the same. We kind of talked about that. Why lower your standards and behaviors to a level outside your faith? It's not about lowering your exp- your standards to yourself. You don't set the bar. So it doesn't make sense when people like they stop at why lower your standards because it, you know as long as you factor in your belief system to absolute truth to a level of faith, that's you know faith is what faith in God, God Himself is the reason for standards and behavior in the first place. So don't go outside your faith to respond or react to retaliate and stand no your power source and abide in the current of his grace. In this way, you diffuse offense, you inspire virtue as a contagious overflow, and you preserve what needs to be said in a spirit of love. The bottom line here, in the presence of evil, in the absence of good, you can't turn the tide if you don't turn the cheek. Don't live in defeat in a moment's heat, but be true to what is right as you inspire others to do the same. Again, pretty basic, but pretty profound when you think about it. I encourage you to stay on these points. Pushing 25 minutes here. So I'm going to go ahead and begin to wind down. Next time I'm going to talk about, well rather, I'm going to return to my Trinity of Scripture series to discuss the Trinity's influence on teamwork. For now, I bid you adieu. If you're on the blog, I'm going to leave an inspiring video from New Hope Church. You could check it out. It has to do with the subject. I'm not going to offer any teasers on the pod here. I'm not a fan of spoilers. 
But I hope that this post, these three ways to contest labels, how to deal with them when they happen, again, real or imagined, a lot of times it's just air. It's not, uh, I mean, there's something that we're sensing, there's something we're seeing, there's something real to that. But a lot of times what we think we're dealing with, it's a mirage or it's, you know, it's a truth is in the middle situation or it's just a far paler derivative than what we think it is. And so much can just go out the wit go out the window and dissolve organically when we approach the person and we're just honest with them i think a lot of situations we feel like we don't have grounds to be honest with people we, we we're nervous about exposing our hearts and insecurities in order to find out the truth and so we don't a lot of times we we just don't go there we will you know we try to keep it within ourselves we just like i just got to flush the insecurity up by myself but even then don't you know boost up this self-independent way of handling conflict within you know independence uh, self-reliance these are not these are not the anecdotes to when the inevitable happens when you sense people are labeling you if it's direct it becomes a little bit more easy when you have evidence then you can deal with that you can bring the evidence to the offender and say you know hey i just want to you know, take a humble approach to it. Like, have I done anything to upset you? I just want to make things right. I, I want to clear the air. I want to own, if there's something that I need to own, I want to own it. If I've misled you, if I've given you something to misread, um, if I've done something inadvertently that rubbed off the wrong way, by all means, pursue peace in that, through the channels of humility. When you start with humility, grace is off, is more than likely the end outcome because humility implies that you're relying on the Lord and that you are channeling his perspective of the situation and not being afraid to be weak and meek at the same time because you're relying on a higher form of strength and when you do that clarity discretion, discernment I think I don't think, I know God is faithful to supply those in abundance and he's going to do the same for you as you troubleshoot some of the matters that you're facing right now with your team, with your coworkers, your colleagues, your clients. Conflicts arise every day. And all I'm trying to do here is offer some basic practical encouragements on when we perceive that people aren't being fair, when they're cutting us out, when they're denying us something that is good, when they box us up in some way, that tempts us to think that we're failures of life. <laughs> Label jars, not people, folks. Don't be so afraid of people missing the real you. God knows you. That's where the meaning of life starts. God has so many positive labels. If you even want to take that approach to it, God has labeled you as good. He has labeled you as Faithful, You are loved. You are a son. You are a daughter. You are chosen, appointed, anointed. You are treasured. You are valued. You are awesome. <laughs> Among so many other things the Bible has to say, I encourage you to dig in and just be like, God, I don't want to believe anything or anyone else that speaks to my identity. Be my source tonight as I close up today. You are all I want, all I need, you are my God. So, Lord, thank you for this word. We prayed in this last minute here. Go about our week. Be the way for us, the truth and the life. Be our source. Replenish us in areas where we feel low in, weak in, insufficient in. Lord, we just want to rely on your sufficiency right now. We thank you for what you do for us. We thank you for your sovereignty, your goodness for your godliness that you have there's a way out there's a way up there's a way in reveal more of your heart to us tonight so that we may reveal it and turn to others we want to reflect the beacon of your love to a lost and depraved generation and to our colleagues our neighbors who don't know you we want to be a part of that conduit that bridge uh, that crosses the divide where your love is easily known that who you are is transparent, that we're giving people every reason to trust you and to see that you are good, to taste and see that you are good. So we pray this in, in Jesus' name, amen. 
All right, guys, I've gone over, but I appreciate you listening. You're so <laughs> you're so awesome. I mean, I know I've said that word a lot in the last couple of minutes, but just know that God has your back, and so do we. So I always say, till next time, we'll catch you on the fry. Peace. <laughs>